Anytime I talk about building a DIY NAS or home server, there's a question that always pops up. How can I add more drives to a system when I don't have any more room? While there are a lot of different options you can use for external enclosures, those can often have some issues or just cost a lot, so I decided to go more of the DIY route. If you're looking for a cheap but effective drive enclosure, this goofy contraption here might just be the answer. Now guys, having a kid and trying to run a full-time YouTube channel can be a lot of work, and having a bowl of cereal in the morning is just convenient, but most cereal options just seem to be loaded with sugar. Fortunately, there's Magic Spoon, the sponsor of today's video. There's something just kind of quaint and nostalgic about curling up on the couch on a Saturday morning with a bowl of cereal, but many of us are all grown up now, and maybe it's time for our cereal to grow up as well. Magic Spoon is cereal upgraded to the 21st century, and it's perfect for a variety of lifestyles. It's made with simple, high-quality ingredients, and each serving contains 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. And somehow it still tastes really good. The variety pack comes in four delicious flavors. Now, I'm personally a fan of dark chocolate that's not too sweet, so it's no surprise that cocoa was my favorite, but surprisingly, fruity came in at a close second. If you're looking to upgrade your cereal, Magic Spoon is a great option for a quick and tasty meal. Or late-night snack, let's be honest. If you're interested, click the link below to try out a variety pack today, and be sure to use the promo code HARDWAREHAVEN at checkout, or go to magicspoon.com slash hardwarehaven to get $5 off any order. And guys, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if for any reason you don't like it, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So again, click the link down below, or scan the QR code on screen, and use the code HARDWAREHAVEN for $5 off, or go to magicspoon.com slash hardwarehaven to save $5 today. Whenever you're faced with the issue of not having enough room for drives in your DIY NAS or home server, there are a few different options. The first and most simple is just to upgrade your case, but that might not always be a realistic option. It's possible you're already using a really large case that has room for a ton of drives, but you just need to add more. Or you just might not have the room. If you're like me and you don't have a server rack, there really aren't that many great options for cases with lots of drive bays. And the ones that do can be fairly massive and pricey. You could go with an external enclosure, like a USB DAS or direct attached storage enclosure. Or you could also get a JBOD like this one from QNAP that uses mini SAS connectors rather than USB. These are pretty expensive though, and while the USB DAS enclosures are usually a bit cheaper, they also come with some drawbacks that I'll talk about more here in a bit. The fact that all of these solutions have some drawbacks led me to this video here. Recently I was browsing AliExpress looking for some spare parts for another project, and came across these acrylic hard drive mounts and this gave me the idea to just DIY my own JBOD enclosure. Now, really quick, what the heck is a JBOD enclosure? Well, JBOD just stands for just a bunch of disks. An enclosure that supports JBOD would present all of the disks inside to the operating system as, well, just a bunch of disks. The operating system would have access to each drive individually and could do what it wants with it. This is sort of in contrast to hardware RAID, where a hardware RAID controller would just present the operating system with one large drive and then handle all of the parity calculations for something like RAID 5 or RAID 10. It seems that the term JBOD is often just used as shorthand to describe disk shelves or enclosures that support JBOD, so that's how I'm going to be using it for the rest of this video. As I said earlier, I often get this question about adding more drives when I'm talking about a DIY NAS or server, often with something like used office PCs. So I decided to test my setup with this Lenovo ThinkStation P310. I actually used this workstation for a few videos quite a while back, including a Proxmox tutorial, and I think it's a perfect candidate for this project. It has an Intel 6th Gen Xeon that can support up to 64GB of DDR4, perfect for virtualization or a true NAS server. It has a generous amount of PCIe expandability and even 6 SATA ports, but only space for two hard drives. Now, if I had a 3D printer, maybe I could print some cool bracket to add a few more bays between the existing two bays. But like many people, I don't have a 3D printer. At least not yet. There's also an option of using something like this adapter from IcyDoc to convert the two five and a quarter inch bays to three, three and a half inch bays to add more hard drives. However, these adapters can actually get pretty expensive and this would still only give us five drive bays total. Plus this actually won't even work with our Lenovo because the five and a quarter inch bays on that system are slightly separated. So this is where having an external JBOD enclosure might be the perfect solution. So I ordered that acrylic mount kit I saw on AliExpress, and it showed up in the mail a couple of weeks later. The clear acrylic is a cool look, but I wanted to match the ThinkStation a bit better, so I gave it a few coats of black spray paint. 
Now I did buy the 10 drive version of this kit, but I'm only going to be using eight four terabyte hard drives. However, I thought the 10 drive kit would give me a little bit more room for cable management or even let me add a couple more hard drives if I really wanted. Plus it was only like a dollar or two more. When I first started attaching the hard drives, I realized this was going to be a little bit more of a pain than I initially expected. First of all, there aren't any shelves for the drives to slide into, so you have to be a bit more creative when trying to get them all in. Also, the kit did come with screws and these little rubber washers to help with vibrations, but I quickly realized that getting the washers between the panels and the drives was going to be extremely tedious. And if you use the washers and then ever need to swap a drive out, well, good luck, because all of the washers are going to get a bit squished and the width of those two panels is gonna be a little bit more narrow. Trying to reinsert a drive with the four washers is going to be practically impossible. So realistically, you'd probably just have to take one side of the entire enclosure off and then replace your drive and then replace all of the washers and all of the screws. And it was going to be just a pretty massive pain. So I just decided to scrap the washers and just screw the drives in directly. Since all of the drives I'm using except for one are either NAS or Enterprise drives, they should be able to handle the vibrations, and I just wasn't quite as concerned about noise. The kit also comes with these little cross pieces to allow you to mount 80mm fans, but those were a massive headache to keep in place. They're a little bit too short, and maybe that was intentional so you could sort of maneuver them in place after it's been screwed together, but it just made them a huge pain to try to keep in place while assembling everything. I initially thought to just scrap them and not use fans, but I figured that wouldn't be quite as fun. So I pushed through and eventually got the top drive, bottom drive, and all of the fan brackets in place. Once that was done, getting all of the other drives in was fairly easy. Once they were all in place, the whole thing felt pretty solid actually. Realistically, the drives are kind of what holds this whole thing together and provides the structure and rigidity. Now, having a stack of hard drives is cool and all, but how do we connect those to our PC? Well, that's where this comes in. This is an HBA or host bus adapter from LSI, and it would typically be used in a server to connect to an external disk shelf using these Minisas SFF8088 connectors. Now, instead of just using normal Minisas cables, I picked up these adapters, which have these 8088 Minisas connectors on one end, but four SATA cables on the other. Each of the Minisas ports on the HBA can support up to four SATA ports each, so we'll only need to use two of them. You can also pick up a variety of other two-port HBAs that will be half-height cards so you can fit it into a smaller system. But keep in mind, anytime you buy one of these HBAs off eBay, try to find one that's been flashed to IT mode. That's what you want for something like TrueNAS. While I was at it, I also dropped in this 10 gigabit NIC that I fixed with a bit of tape just a while back. So that's how we'll connect our drives to our PC, but how are we going to power them all? I could maybe get away with running some extensions from the internal power supply out to the drives, but honestly on this Lenovo system, I don't quite trust that that power supply could handle eight drives as well as whatever other drives we may have in the system. So instead, I decided to use this EVGA 80 plus bronze power supply that I just have sitting around. Unfortunately, I only have two of the SATA cables for it, and while one of them has four SATA power connections, the other one only has three. So I decided to pick up two of these one to four SATA power splitters, and I'm glad I did. They actually made the wiring on the back of the drives pretty clean looking. After plugging them all in, I just had two SATA power connectors that I connected to the two cables coming from the power supply. Now it's possible that we could short some pins on our second power supply and then just make sure we turn it on before we turn on the system, but then we'd have to make sure we manually turn it off anytime we turn the system off and that would sort of be a pain. So instead, I decided to go with a slightly more sophisticated route and use this thing here, which is called an add to PSU. The idea here is that you connect the 24 pin connector from your second power supply here, and then any number of other connectors from the main power supply. Whenever the main PC switches on, the add to PSU immediately also signals for the second power supply to switch on, essentially linking the two power supplies. The ThingStation actually has a six pin ATX connector for a graphics card that's not being used. So I plugged that in and then plugged in the 24 pin connection from our second power supply. Now, obviously this setup is really messy, but I wanted to test things out first before getting it all cleaned up. So I plugged in all of the SATA ports, added an SSD with TrueNAS scale to the ThingStation and plugged in the power cables. Unfortunately though, the power supply for our JBOD kicked on immediately. It turns out that for some reason, the six pin connector was keeping the add to PSU signaled on constantly. Fortunately, I swapped that out for a SATA power connector and here goes nothing. All right, that kicked on both power supplies. So our drives are spun up right now. This is booting up. We have a post. The HBA is initializing. All right, I see. Looked like eight drives. I think we're looking good.
I did have a few of these grub errors that I'm still not quite sure about, but after about 30 seconds, the system booted into TrueNAS with no issues, and all eight of our drives showed up. With the proof of concept working, I decided to get all of the cables tidied up a bit. I had the idea to stash the add to PSU and some of the cables from the power supply inside the PC case. I was hoping to avoid any destructive measures and just slide the cables through the bottom PCIe slot, but it seemed like there just sadly wasn't quite enough clearance. So I ended up removing this one support, and that gave enough clearance for the cables to slip through and stay somewhat hidden away. I started using some zip ties to tidy up the cables, but probably should have waited because right around that time, my fans showed up. These showed up a bit late because, like I mentioned earlier, I originally thought to scrap the idea of fans altogether, but instead I decided to order three of these 80mm Redux fans from Noctua. Some black fans might have blended in a little bit better, but I feel like these gray fans kind of give the whole thing a bit of a vibe. Now realistically, I think because of the open design, you probably don't even need fans on this thing, especially if you're using 5400 RPM drives and are putting it in a somewhat ventilated space. If you did use 7200 RPM drives and or you were putting this in a closet or something, then the fans might be a bit more necessary. To control and power the fans, I picked up this little gizmo, which allows you to power up to eight fans from a six pin ATX connector and also adjust the speed. Adding the fans was a pain as I had to take out a bunch of the drives to get access to the screws. I eventually got them all mounted and I stuck the controller inside the bottom of the enclosure. After a bit of cable management, I think the whole setup started to look pretty cool. In TrueNAS, I set up all eight drives in a single RAID Z2 VDEV, and then set up my 10 gigabit connection. Write performance wasn't great, but that's to be expected with a single RAID Z2 VDEV. Streaming read performance was pretty solid though. When reading a 20 gigabyte video file, I was seeing around 700 to 800 megabytes per second, and that's with only 16 gigabytes of RAM, so the ARC cache wasn't completely carrying us here. When writing files to the array, the power supply for the DIY JBOD was consuming around 55 to 60 watts of power. That puts each of our hard drives drawing around 7 watts of power or so, which is about what you would expect and means our power supply isn't grossly inefficient or anything. Noise was actually not that noticeable, even without the rubber washers. Obviously there was some clicking that you would expect, especially with the enterprise drives, but I didn't really notice much noise from vibrations. The system fans, and especially the little fan on the 10 gigabit NIC, were much more noticeable, and the Noctua fans were pretty much inaudible. Honestly, this little weird DIY JBOD seemed to be working pretty well, but was it all worth it? How does it stack up to other options? Well first, let's take a look at how much it cost. For the acrylic panels, I spent $22 on AliExpress, but just so you know, you can find this same kit for around $24 on Amazon. I spent $47 on the LSI HBA, and once again, you can find these for pretty similar prices on eBay. The mini SAS to SATA adapters were $18 a piece, and while I had the power supply on hand, it probably would have cost me around $30 to buy the exact same or a similar model on eBay. I also spent $15 on the add to PSU, which brought the total cost for the main components of this system to right around $150. If you needed to buy the SATA power splitters or just wanted them for aesthetics, that'll run around another $20. I spent $13 on each Noctua fan and then $10 for the little controller, which brought the total cost of the system to around $220. Although I should note if you just bought the eight bay enclosure that only comes with two fan slots, so you'd save about 10 bucks there or so. Now, if you start looking up USB 8-bay drive enclosures, you'll notice a lot of those aren't that much more expensive. Those enclosures are going to be much cleaner looking, more compact, probably quieter, and a lot easier to replace drives in. But if you start looking around on forums and such where people talk about using these DAS enclosures with something like TrueNAS, you'll find plenty of examples where people have experienced weird dropouts or other connectivity issues due to USB. Also, a lot of these units, especially the cheaper ones, don't always report all of the information like serial numbers, for example. I actually ran into this exact same issue with this cheap little four bay two and a half inch enclosure. It didn't report the serial numbers correctly to TrueNAS, which means I couldn't really use it. Also, most of the more affordable 8-bay enclosures I found are going to be limited to 5 gigabit per second USB connections. When using hard drives, that might not be the biggest limitation, but we can see from just our previous tests that that would in fact be a bottleneck. One of the only units I found that at least seemed to support 10 gigabit per second USB was this one from QNAP, which costs over double what we spent on our DIY JBOD. Now, speaking of QNAP, they do make this cool JBOD enclosure here, which also uses mini SAS connections and a PCIe card rather than USB. 
Once again, this is going to be much cleaner, more compact, quieter, easier to service, and it's not going to have any of the bandwidth or connectivity issues. But it does cost almost three times what we spent on our DIY unit. Also, I didn't mention this earlier, but you can look into used enterprise disk shelves that would have been used in server racks. However, space requirements and noise might be two factors to consider. And with these, you'll still have to pay for an HBA as well as cables to hook it up. Obviously, our DIY solution is a bit messy, not very compact, and just a bit janky, but it works and you can't really argue that. With this setup, you're not going to have to deal with the bandwidth limitations or dropout concerns of cheaper USB enclosures, and it's a lot cheaper than more sophisticated options. Plus, if you ever need to expand, that's going to be a lot cheaper as well. Because the power supply and HBA were a pretty big chunk of our initial cost, adding eight more drives wouldn't be that expensive. All you need to do is buy another one of those acrylic mount kits, a couple more cables, and fans if you really needed them. So for another 80 or $100 or so, you have eight more drive bays to start plugging in more drives. So all in all, especially if you, for example, already have an extra power supply on hand, and as long as you don't mind the jank, this isn't the worst solution. I'd love to know what your thoughts are though on this weird little enclosure, so make sure and put those down in the comments below. Maybe let me know what you'd like me to do with this, because I was originally planning on just tearing it apart after this video, but I kind of like it. I kind of want to use it again somehow. So if you have any ideas, make sure and put those in the comments below. Also, if you like this video and the other videos I make, maybe consider supporting me as a raid member either here on YouTube or on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. There's a lot of cool perks, so it might just be worth checking out. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.